Hello, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Cloud English Podcast. My name is Luke. It's great to have you here on this Friday, February 10th, 2029, I think the year is. Yes, yes, that's correct. It's great to have you. We have a lot of things to talk about. Let me just go over a few things that we will be covering before we get into it, a few things right at the top of today's show. So, we're going to be talking about what you can do to decrease mistakes and increase English fluency. You may think, huh, that's complicated. Well, I'm going to give you a sort of let's call it a game plan that I think is going to really help you a lot. You don't have to use it, but I think if you do, you're you're going to see some uh, some I think really big improvement, okay? Then we're going to talk about some odd phrasing. Now, there is a difference between odd phrasing and let's call it incorrect English, right? Odd phrasing might be incorrect in the sense that nobody says it like that, but still grammatically correct. So how does that work? Well, we're going to talk about that as well. I'm going to be giving you some examples and how we might say things more naturally. That should be interesting. We're then going to talk about some useful idioms and words for mistakes, because that is what we are focusing on today. And for example, what the heck does blow it mean? And is that different than screw up or what, right? What's the difference between those anyway, right? Then I have a very interesting little segment planned about commas. That's coming up as well. Commas can make a very big difference when it comes to meaning. <laughs> and we're going to look at some, I think, very cool examples there. Well, cool, maybe not cool. Interesting, useful, insightful, um, cool, eh, maybe not cool. Not definitely not cool, uh, but 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 interesting and insightful and useful. What else? So if you'd like uh, and you enjoy the podcast or the videos that I put out, a like and a comment would be sincerely appreciated as well as a subscribe or follow. Those watching live, hit follow and make sure you're subscribed so that you can see future podcast episodes of the Cloud English Podcast, as well as future videos. I do release videos a few times per week. And if you want, you can listen. There's a growing audience who prefers, apparently, to listen to this podcast rather than watch because I honestly who wants to see my dumb face for two hours I certainly wouldn't and so I certainly don't blame those of you who prefer to listen hello to you you can check that out in the links in the description and vice versa if you if you prefer to watch you can do that okay if you want, you can get a free English course, Natural English Conversations. That's in the links in the description as well. That is a one-hour course that teaches you in a very, I think, engaging way how to have natural English conversations, like the title suggests. And if you'd like, you can get 30% off. There's a link in the description to that, to my full courses. That's the monthly membership, and that's 30% off for 12 months. So every month it's 30% off, not just for the first month. Okay. And that gives you access to all the courses that are there on that website. Um, hmm. What else? I don't think there is anything else. Oh, yes. One more thing. There's a discord if you want to join it. I've just been informed that it's horribly run. Uh, in terms of, you know, setting things up and making it a really well-structured community. And that's fair, but we're working on it. Uh, it's a place to, you know, get updates about things and chat if you want to. Uh, I'm learning Discord as we go along, right? Uh, figuring out how to use bots to organize things and 
make custom emotes. That's something I'm going to be adding. And it'll, I think, over time, let's say over the next year, over time, it will gradually become this, I think, very cool place to be. Now, it's probably not cool at all, but it could become cool. And the only way to make it cool is for you to join, be there and help. So check that out as well. Okay, so that's it. That's all I have to say for now. I see we have some people joining as well. Abhishek, hello and welcome. That's an interesting question, the correct usage of unless and until. I think something that I could get to a little bit later on because I do want to get to a my, well, an initial few thoughts that I'd like to share, okay? So, what if you want to improve your English very quickly? That's a question that people ask me all the time. It's so slow. I want to improve my fluency faster, right? Great. Is there any way? Is it even possible? I think the answer is yes, except I think most people won't be able to improve their fluency, their overall English ability quickly because they're not willing to do the kind of crazy stuff that you have to do in order to unlock your brain, change your habits, set new habits, right? Learn from your mistakes, develop keen self-awareness and actually start making real steps toward that natural, that fluent sound that you want. So again, can it be done quickly? I think the answer is yes. If you want to do it quickly, I'm going to give you a few recommendations, okay? Oh, and 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 one thing before I start with that, right? There's a tendency I've noticed among those who do not improve that there's this paralyzing fear of humiliation. If you fear humiliation to be embarrassed when you speak, embarrassed in public, embarrassed to make mistakes, you are probably self-selecting out of the group of people who are going to improve more quickly. You have to get over that fear of public humiliation and embarrassment if you're going to make progress. Why? If you're afraid to try anything, then how can you learn enough to fail to learn from those mistakes to then improve? So the first thing you have to do is change your mindset if you have this mindset to be a mindset of try, 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 fail as you go, figure it out as you go, and not worry too much about humiliation. Humiliation is something that's generally in your head. No one else really cares that much. So do not fear mistakes. Mistakes are your friend. You can use mistakes as powerful little tools to figure out what's better, right? If, if you never learn from mistakes, okay, that's bad. But if you can use mistakes as a tool for learning, that's good, right? And also remember that it's not this binary thing where I'm a good English speaker and you're not. And unless you're where I am or someone else is, then you're nothing. Uh, you shouldn't speak. Absolutely not. I Nobody's perfect. Yeah, I'm an English teacher, but I say stuff that sounds dumb all the time. <laughs> Everybody does. Nobody's perfect. Nobody has access to this perfect state of English. It's a gradient from zero English to very articulate to people who are really good speakers. And I, I wouldn't put myself even near the top. There are people who are really good at it. But if you ask them, they would say, oh, I'm not even close. There are these other people that are way more articulate and natural than me. So get this idea out of your head that it's sort of a good, not good situation. Or there's some state you're trying to reach where now I have arrived. No, also not that, right? It is a gradient. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, some, let's call them things that you can do right now. I'm going to give you a sort of guidelines step by step. So here we go. Okay. First, I want you to identify your top 
10 issues. If you don't know what those are, then your first step is to figure out what those are. Write those down like it's a checklist, okay? How do you figure those out if you don't already know? There are several ways to do it. You can, if you can identify them yourself, maybe record yourself speaking, get over that discomfort of watching yourself, you know, in a recording or listening to yourself in a recording, or you might go out and take a few lessons with a teacher. Figure it out. It's up to you. Figure out what your top 10 issues are. Make them very specific. A, a top 10 issue wouldn't be like bad English. It would be like always mixing up tenses in the past from simple past to present perfect and past perfect. Okay, that's a pretty good specific one. Okay, write down those top 10 things that are getting in the way of your fluency. Okay, number two, then practice speaking on your own, right? Often, every day or at least whenever you can and be consistent with it regularly practice and I strongly recommend that you record that because that's going to force you to get into this pattern, this thought pattern of having to form thoughts into speech. And if you get into that pattern and you start looking back at what you say, you're going to start building these little interesting feedback loops that help you not only identify what your issues are but start to catch when you do them then self-correct, try again, and again, you have these feedback loops that are very powerful. Okay, number three, when you speak, slow down and do not fear pauses, okay? It's okay to speak slowly. There is this common misconception that fluency equals speed, and that is not the case. Fluency does not equal speed, and if you speak more slowly, then you're more likely to be able to hear things that you say, catch yourself, pause, fix that, and then keep moving forward. If you're able to pause and catch something and make a correction, then you're going to start fixing those habits. If you speak at lightning speed all the time, then it's hard to catch anything and it just flies right by. And then what you're doing is digging those bad habits that you want to correct digging those in deeper so that it's more and more difficult to change those bad habits, okay? Next, oh, and by the way, on pausing, if you pause for four or five seconds, it's not a big deal. Just pause, think, and then speak, okay? So don't be afraid of that. Make a deliberate effort to listen for the issues that you have and since you've made a list of 10, then you're just listening for those 10, okay? This is to help you narrow down the scope of your progress. You might have 10 new issues once you get to a certain point where the first 10 are really pretty close to being solved, right? So then you might have a new set. But if you're just focusing on 10 things, then you're not trying to think about everything at the same time and that makes life a little more manageable when you're trying to improve your English, okay? So as you're speaking, hopefully you're recording yourself if you're doing it as an exercise, listen for those 10 things. You should know those like the back of your hand, know what those are, okay? So then you force yourself to pause and make a correction every single time. Every time you hear yourself say, oops, I accidentally used the present perfect tense, I probably should have used the past perfect tense there, then make that correction. Every time you do that, you're building a new habit and breaking down the bad habit, the old habit. And the more times you do that, right, those 10 things are going to start to go down. 10 becomes nine, nine becomes seven, seven becomes three. And before you know it, you've solved these 10 issues by developing that self-awareness because you're speaking slowly and listening very carefully to what you say, right? Making self-corrections and then building stronger habits with those self-corrections, okay? And if you just do that and you really do it, you're going to make a lot of progress.
Now, most people are not going to do that, I know, but if you do that, you're going to make a lot of progress. A few key things to keep in mind, though. You want to be pretty brutally honest with yourself. If you can't be brutally honest with yourself, you're going to be too subjective. You're going to say, you're going to skip over stuff. You're going to say to yourself, ah, okay, I'll skip it that time. Um, that, that was fine. That was good enough. Be brutally honest. Okay, did you say it correctly or not? Are you using that the right way or not, right? You want to be as objective as possible. And I think recording is a great way to help you do that. As I said, you want to force yourself to overcome that fear of humiliation. If you find yourself not speaking at all because you're afraid of being judged, then you're never going to really improve. That's well, just not possible because how can you if you're not willing to communicate, right? Things don't get better unless you do things. <laughs> you have to develop that keen self-awareness, right? As I said, that self-awareness is going to be the tool that allows you to catch things as you're speaking that then allows you to turn bad habits into good habits that allows you to then make your list, check off the things on your list of 10 things you're working on, and then make a new list of 10 things you're working on. I have several things I'm working on. This is a gradient. This is a process that we're all in together. It's not, I'm over here, I'm the teacher, you listen to me, you're on your own journey. No. I think we're on the same path. I might have a few advantages because I was born in a native English-speaking country. I grew up in the language. But I would say we're on the same general path of learning how to express ourselves well, right? When we speak, <laughs> that's what we're doing. And so what I'm telling you is stuff that I've figured out that has helped me improve how I communicate. And so I'm sharing that with you to help you along that path and if you take a few of those steps, you're going to start seeing, seeing progress. And when you see progress, you're going to start building confidence. And as you build confidence, you're going to start identifying new challenges and the landscape really starts to open up. But if you're trapped in a little shell of fear and anxiety about speaking, then it's, it's unlikely that you're going to make progress, okay? So if you have any questions about this, let me know. I would love to hear about where you are on your journey and what kind of commitment you have to yourself when it comes to making progress on your spoken English, okay? Again, any questions, let me know. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Also, get a free course in the links in the description, right? Honestly, that is the key, I think to making genuine progress. And the, the crazy thing is people who make progress, it's a minority of people. Most people simply aren't willing to step out of their comfort zone enough to do something difficult. <laughs> and you gotta, you gotta take a step out if you're gonna make any progress whatsoever, right? It has to be said, it has to be said. Okay, now I think I can answer one question quickly before we go on to our next topic. We're going to be talking about odd phrasing. That, that doesn't mean incorrect. That means just stuff that sounds, well, odd. And we're going to get to that next. After I take a sip of British tea. What, what is this? Oh, I spilled some on my... Ow. This is tea... W G, the finest teas of the world. 1837. Hey, that's what year it is now. So this company, this company was uh, founded this year. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's take a look at. Abhishek's question here. What's the correct usage of unless and until? Let me think about that for a second, how to frame that question. That's a, it's a good one, of course, but let me think about it. Give me a second to think here. Unless and until. Okay. 
hmm, you know what? I'm gonna skip it simply because for unless I would wanna have a list of examples and I could come up with a few off the top of my head, but mm, I don't know if I'd be able to come up with good ones on the spot specifically for unless. That probably deserves a video on its own, right? Okay, so let's 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 move on to our to our thing. Let's move on to our thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic Friday. If you're listening or watching this on Friday, if it's another day, I hope you're having a fantastic whatever day that that is. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about this. Where's where am I? Where's my? Move myself a little bit. There we go. That's better. That's better. Kathy messed up the alignment of my video. Kathy? How dare you? Okie dokie. So, when it comes to speaking naturally, speaking English naturally, we're not just talking about things that are grammatically correct or incorrect. No. What we're talking about is natural or unnatural. Unnatural meaning perhaps odd phrasing. So what makes something odd? What makes something unnatural? I don't know. It's a case by case thing. But that's the weird thing about it is some of this stuff is just the way that people say it. And we could try to understand it. We could try to have an in-depth explanation for why is that? But sometimes that's not that useful. What we really want to do is just say, hey, here's a thing that doesn't sound natural to a native English speaker, and this is how they would say it. <laughs> now, you can, you can draw insights from that by sort of noticing other things that are similar to that and maybe learning how to phrase things naturally, right? So that's good, but at a certain point, we have to say it's not about the grammar. It's not about the grammar. It's just about what we could call common usage. So let's hop into, we're going to go through examples. I'm going to give you things that I've heard very often uh, non-native English speakers say not knowing maybe that it doesn't sound natural, then I'm going to give you the natural version of it, okay? And we'll just go through these one by one. And it won't be every single one, of course, but we'll cover a fair, I think, a fair number, okay? Okay, deal, deal, deal. All right. So, people should carry out a hobby. I can try to give a sense for why this is, but think about this for yourself. What would you say? How would you say this? People should carry out a hobby. Something odd about this. Does it sound weird to you? Does it sound natural to you? How does it sound? Sounds weird to me, but I've heard it a number of times. I write these down. I listen to people. I write down what people say. And I think, ooh, that's one I could talk about <laughs> later. So if you're talking to me, I'm not judging you, but I am writing down what you say. <laughs> to use later, right? So to carry something out generally means a specific task, right? Carry out my instructions, these instructions that I'm giving you. A natural way to say this for something general, like a hobby, would be to simply have a hobby. We would say people should have a hobby. So we would have something more general and then carry out something like instructions, uh, carry out maybe uh, some specific task that you have for yourself, right? Carry out is a phrase, is a phrasal verb that we use, but just not in this case, okay? So I'm not saying carry out is something you should never say. You should say carry out, just not for something general, okay? Next one. Owning a car is not worthy not worthy. Hmm. Okay. So how would you say this one more naturally? What would be a more natural way to say this? It's not worthy. What if we change the phrasing? 
it's not worthy to own a car. Still weird. Still weird. Okay, well, I've heard people say, I'm not worthy, right? That's right. When we say worthy, we're usually talking about a person feeling like they deserve something if they are worthy, or they do not deserve something if they aren't worthy. And it also has this sort of formal feeling to it of extreme importance. An example would be, for example, an example would be, for example, yeah, okay, Thor always talks about being worthy of the hammer, right? You can't pick up the hammer, Thor's hammer, unless you are worthy. Worthy of what? I don't know, the divine power of of Odin uh, or whatever it is, the, the, what is it called? The Bifrost? Yeah, yeah, I guess someone has said that you are worthy. So it's this really formal thing, right? But what if we're just talking about value, everyday stuff like having a car or maybe taking the bus or something like this ordinary thing, then we would simply say probably it's not worth owning a car. So just worth, worth, not worthy, changes everything. Now we're talking about mundane stuff, everyday life, right? Would you say it's worth owning a car if you live in the city? Nah, probably not. If you just take the subway and take the bus, that's probably a much more convenient way to get around. It's not really worth owning a car. So worth and worthy, don't mix those up. Worthy, very important stuff like Thor and his hammer. Worth it. It's not worth it. It is worth it. I think it's worth really understanding hmm, this thing that we're trying to solve. So we're, we're, we think it's valuable to do that, but it's still kind of this ordinary thing, okay? I want to be a friend with you. Now, <laughs> the only reason I bring this one up is because I've heard it so many times. First, <laughs> don't say this to people, period. Don't say this kind of thing to people, period. Because it's weird to request friendship of someone in general, in my opinion. That's not how friends are made. You don't make friends by saying, hello there, my name's Luke, would you like to be friends? It's this gradual process of getting to know someone and then eventually you realize, hey, okay, we're friends. <laughs> we don't have to announce it and it certainly isn't something we, we say at the beginning, right? So first, don't say this. Don't say any version of this. Don't even say the thing I'm about to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so if you wanted to say this sentence naturally, be a friend with you is odd phrasing, right? Because a, be a friend, okay, be a friend with you is almost adding too much complexity to something that has a very simple meaning. So when something is too long and too complex, but the meaning is very basic, it's usually going to sound unnatural. Can we be friends is a natural way to say this, right? But again, while this is the natural way to say it, I recommend very strongly that you never say it to anybody. <laughs> if anyone says to me, can we be friends, that immediately disqualifies them from being friends with me. <laughs> In my head, I'm like, nope. <laughs> so if you want to be friends with me, don't say, don't say anything like this. Instead, maybe you can say, hey, how's it going? Uh, what are, you know, what uh, kind of stuff are you working on? Or uh, what, why are you visiting? Just ask me something contextual, then we can start having a conversation, right? Uh, so don't say, can we be friends? So two, two levels there. One is the language level and one is the, let's say, cultural norms level maybe yeah how about this one we seldom travel abroad you might say hey wait grammatically perfect right there's a word there's a frequency word there's a there's a broad means other countries yeah yeah fair enough but the word seldom is kind of uh well it's seldom used it's more often used in the uk than in the united states i would say 
but it is, I believe, kind of slowly fading out of the language. It's becoming more and more seldom used. So instead of saying seldom, I would change another word there. And also abroad. I, again, I feel like this word is becoming antiquated. It feels like it's kind of slowly drifting out of the language. I would recommend using another word there that means the same thing. So here's how I would say that. I would say we rarely travel internationally. That's what I would say. We rarely travel internationally. Rarely is much more common than seldom and international or internationally, depending on what you want to say, is much more common than uh, uh, than abroad. Uh, go abroad, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It just, in my view, sounds a little antique and I would recommend perhaps going with international or internationally, depending on depending on what you're trying to say, okay? Moving on, moving right along. I did some preparation before the event. Okay, so what's happening here? I think I can explain why this one doesn't sound natural. Number one, I think it's too long for a simple meaning like we talked about. If you have something that's pretty simple and you, you say more than you need to say in order to express that, it's not so good. So we can also look for redundancy, I think. What's the redundancy here? I did some preparation. Well, one is I know that preparation has a verb form. So if I say I did some preparation, maybe it would be better to just use the verb form of preparation and then I don't have to say did. Okay, well, that's, that's one thing. But also there's another piece of redundancy here with prepare and before. Because the word prepare means to do something before, right? To be ready before. So isn't that a little bit redundant? I would say yes, yes. So we just say I prepared before the event. Prepare then becomes the verb, past tense, instead of having to say did preparation, much more natural. And then what is it for? It's for the event. But we don't have to say before the event because the word prepare means something that happens before. That's what the word pre means. Pre means something that happens before, right? So I think that would be a much better way to say it, okay? We have a few more of these we're gonna go over. You should take more rest. Take more rest? Take more rest. Hmm. Now, wrong, is it? Grammatically correct? It is grammatically correct. If you were going to say this with this structure, I would go with you should probably get more rest. And I think that's fine. It's okay if, if we change take to get. I hear take a lot, though. You should take more rest. It's awkward uh, in the verb and rest. It's a little bit awkward. Take and, and rest specifically. Now, if you use take with nap, that sounds a little more natural. I'm taking a nap. You should take a nap. That's okay. It's a specific thing. Rest is more general. It's not a thing that you do. You would have a nap, but you wouldn't say to have, well, I guess you could say a rest, but it would be more natural to say just rest. You should rest. So if you wanted to say that, that would be already way more natural and I think better. You should rest. Better than take a rest or anything like that. But I would recommend get some rest. So it's fine to use to use get if you want, right? But make it simpler and if you want to use rest as a noun, use it as a noun, that's fine. But use some because it's not a thing. We're not talking about it as a thing that you're doing. If you want to say one thing, then it would be probably nap in that case. Take a nap. Get some rest. Uh, take a rest is grammatically okay, but to me it sounds a little bit awkward 
and it's not nearly as common, I think, as get some rest, okay? Okay, if it were me, I would probably just say, go rest, or rest for a while. Start with rest, and then say, you know, that you should do that, to invite someone to do that for an hour or two if they need to. Rest for a few hours, you've been working hard, go rest for a little while, right? But that's just me. I'm just giving you one more natural way to say it, okay? How about this? Everyone is not perfect. So this one is actually grammatically wrong. This is one that, that I hear quite often, but it mixes up how everyone is usually used, right? Everyone is not perfect is saying that the whole group of humanity as a group, right, isn't perfect. And, and it's okay, yeah, if you say that, but then it starts to lose its meaning because we're focusing on such a huge, gigantic group, right? But if we want to make these kinds of general statements, we want to say, yes, I'm talking about this whole group, but I mean each one individually, not the whole collective. If I say, for example, uh, the, the class is bad. Well, the class is this whole group. But if I say, if I say, every student in the class is bad, that feels a lot different than I'm zooming in and saying, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Every, every person in the class is bad. Those are two very different things. In this case, if you say everyone is not perfect, then I'm talking about this gigantic group and it's almost hard to conceptualize what that would mean, right? If I wanted to say it like this, I would say everyone is imperfect. Instead of saying is not perfect, I would probably use imperfect. But what I'm going to say instead is nobody is perfect. It just sounds more natural to focus on the individual level. So instead of this whole group, I'm saying that one, 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 not that one, not that one, not that one. Nobody is perfect. And I'll, I'll make it a little shorter by saying nobody's. Nobody is nobody's. Nobody's perfect. It's just a more natural way to say it. And I think for this case, it actually makes more, makes more logical sense in my view. Nobody's perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. That's the common way to say it. Okay, last one. I wish I won't be late. What about this one? How would you say this? I wish I won't be late. When we use the word wish as opposed to a word like hope, right? We generally talk about things with wish, right? that are a bit more abstract, especially things that we're thinking about that are not true now, but could be true, right? So for example, to say I wish it were warm today, or I wish I were in a sunny place on the beach, is to say, yeah, I'm not there, <laughs> I'm not on the beach, I'm not relaxing, but it would be nice. <laughs> so it's sort of, having an imagination about something that I I want to be true or that might be nice, right? Whereas when we say hope, we tend to be focusing on the future. If I say, for example, I hope I'm not late, then I'm on the way to somewhere and it could go either way. I could be on time or I could be late. I'm on the bus, it depends on the traffic, right? But I'm talking about a real future. And in this real future, I might be late or I might not be late. So I hope, I hope I have a hundred million dollars by the time I'm 50. Well, okay. So that's talking about something in the future that may or may not happen. I think hope might be a better word to use there. Now, if you say, I wish I have a hundred million dollars by the time I'm 50, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's a little it's a little odd as a way to use that word because wish tends to be about not real things, 
that we imagine to be true now in a sort of alternative current now situation, right? I wish I had $10 million or $50 million. What did I say? I forget. I wish I had that. Now I wish I had that, right? So that's usually how we use wish and hope is for usually the future, what may or may not actually happen, okay? So these are just a few specific things that we can fix, things that are not necessarily grammatically incorrect, but things that we can fix to sound more natural when we're speaking English. If you have any questions about any of these, please let me know or any other questions related to this, let me know. And if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. You ought to get there on time, not late. Thanks a lot, uh, Luke, says Rolf. Thank you very much, Rolf. And Vitali is here. No one is perfect. Nobody is perfect. I think that's a good way to say that. Yep, absolutely. I'm just reviewing the chat here. No one's perfect. I think no one's perfect is pretty much the same as nobody's perfect. So yeah, you, you guys got that one right. How easy is English? Did you notice? Get rest. Uh, I think I would add get some there. Get some rest would be okay. Get in the car. You should take it easy. Let's see. I prepared some before the event. Again, I would not I would not put prepare and before together, AJ, because it's a little redundant because prepare means to do something before. Okay? Abby Sheck says we rarely travel abroad. I think that would be fine. Again, I'm not saying abroad is wrong. I recommend internationally because it's more common, but I would keep abroad before I would keep seldom. I would get rid of seldom first. <laughs> oh, he's real. I thought it's a video playing itself. I'm going to take that as a comment, as a compliment, AJ, that you thought it was a recording, <laughs> a pre-recorded video. Uh, or maybe it was, and then I switched. You never know. You never know. But I will take that as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm really here. I was just talk. I I was just talking continuously as I was going through that topic. But if you have, I see now you have some uh, some things you wanted to add, and so I'm just looking through some of the comments here. N Lari uh, El Nari, excuse me, says. Can I use the word air instead of before? The answer is a strong no. Uh, air is, let's call it, it's not old English, but it's definitely outdated English. And it's something that you would see in poetry. It's something you'd see traditionally, you know, 17th, 18th century, well, maybe 19th century too, but no, absolutely not. Uh, I don't think I've ever said it or written it in my entire life. It's completely out of the modern language. Air is archaic. Exactly. Exactly, Vitaly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, AJ. AJ says, you're doing a great job, sir. Some will be able to earn more by improving their English, and I find this method very effective. Earn more or learn more. But if they earn more, that's good too, right? I'm I'm okay with people earning more. All right, I'm gonna take a quick tea break. How about this? How about this? Let's just for the just for a, just give me a minute to drink some tea, rest my my poor voice. Let's see some. Since our theme today is on. Uh, since our theme today is mistakes, let's check out some bloopers. A blooper. So a blooper is a clear mistake that someone has made. Often you see something called a blooper reel. After movies have played, you'll see uh, maybe a few mistakes that they made during the production of the movie. So let's see some news bloopers.
Don't take a break, says AJ. AJ, I need a quick tea break. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm just going to sort of uh, chill out for a second because I need to because my my poor brain, my poor, poor brain. Okay. Not so pale. You're on it. Today's snow is crippling much of the Washington lowlands. DD Mega Doo Doo. I'm sorry, Mangudu. Once it's turned on, the sign will spell out Delhi Cat Essen. Can you demonstrate for us what it's like to brush our teeth, pet, just a little bit? Certainly. It's going to be areas of drist and mizzle. Uh, drist and what am I saying here? Mist and drizzle. I literally combined both. Here's some other great town names. Latitz. Oh, it's Linitz. <laughs> Linitz. <laughs> it's confirming the ground is now good to say. Oh, you've been joined by a beautiful lady. There's a mine, actually, Derek. <laughs> I just kept hearing it. I'm ducking and everything. Died in the house. I'm. I got scared. I dropped my hot pocket. Let's get excited about that 69. I mean, yeah. that's pretty good this time of year, isn't it? I, I know you're excited about the wind, but no, no, no. I want that 69. Over the last two years, hundreds have landed in the Summit County Medical Examiner's Office. My brother used to break in our house and steal the TV. But now he's dead. We'll probably sit around and cook some soups and eat bread and desserts and just get all <laughs> fat and sassy. Wow. <laughs> Uh, you like the, uh, uh, um, a slight chance of some particip participation, participate, per, per, it's rain. It's going to bring a possibility of some rain that will be moving into our area. Um, did you grab anything when you I walked out the door? I grabbed nothing but two Tortino's pizza out of the refrigerator and my doggie, and we left. That's it. <laughs> I, I tried to grab some other things, but they Tortino's. wasn't even worth it. I don't know that's why I don't hold, hold on, hold it. What's that? Move it. It's okay. Come a little closer. Do I'm going to stay over here by Joni. Do they know each do They no, Hold him tight. Hold I, him tight. Hold I, him tight. I am. I am. Hold him tight. I am. I am. You got him. I am. Oh, it's okay. All right. All right, Joni. You got him. Um, first and last name, please. Uh, Erica O'Donnell. And can you spell first and last? F-I-R-S-T-L-A-S-T. <laughs> I met your first and last name. Uh, <laughs> uh, ridiculous. Ridiculous. I like the, uh, yeah, the first and last one is funny. People do that stuff all the time, right? They're just not usually on TV. Humans are weird, interesting creatures for sure. For sure, for sure. Okay. I think we're going to start with some idioms, and then we'll get into a few other things. So we're going to get into some, some idioms for uh, mistakes, but then later we're going to be talking about commas and how we can use commas to change the meaning and how commas can also cause misunderstandings, right? By the way, if you haven't done so yet, you can uh, uh, check out a free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the description, and you can join the Discord server, uh, which is in the links in the description under Discord, right? So feel free to do that. Talk about interview questions. AJ, you may want to join me next Thursday for interview questions. So I do a uh, live every week with uh, Pearson English. You can check them out on YouTube or LinkedIn. And they, um, I'm doing a collaboration with them and we're doing an interview series and so you can check that out there every Thursday, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
I believe that's 1 p.m. GMT. And we're going to be getting into interview questions uh, this Thursday or next Thursday. So look forward to that. DD Mega Doo Doo. <laughs> How do you get that? How do you get that from that? <laughs> okay. Let's. We're gonna hop over to the blackboard here. Let me get. Let me get. Get that set up. Oh, you know what? Let me move this over. Interview questions for Walmart. You know, I'll be honest. I don't know any specific interview questions for Walmart. Um, I haven't. I don't have a lot of experience with Walmart's job interview process. I would have to do a little research. I wouldn't want to give a hasty answer there and say, you know, um, uh, here's how Walmart does it uniquely without knowing. So I would need to do a little research before I could, before I could give you an answer on that. I don't know. Does Walmart have anything specific or unique to its process as opposed to a company like Target, for example? I, I honestly, I honestly do not know. All right, idioms for mistakes. There are a lot of phrases, idioms that we can use in English to talk about mistakes that we make, but they're not all exactly the same, right? Some of them might be very similar, but they might be used in different ways. What are the different ones we could use to talk about mistakes? And how are they used? Well, that's what we're going to focus on now. So what we're going to do is go through a few of these. We're going to talk about dropping the ball, blowing it, screwing up, shooting yourself in the foot, missing the boat. Okay. And again, these are all slightly different in, in the way that they're used. Some of these have exactly the same meaning, but maybe used just a little bit differently. So there's, we could say, nuance to all of them. Okay, so why don't we start? Why don't we start with drop the ball? Now, I think we could say this probably comes from sports. To drop the ball is when you're not supposed to do that and you do it by accident. American football, it could be from that. I'm actually not sure which sport it's originally from, if it's American football or baseball. But often to drop the ball is not something you want to do, right? But how do we use this? Well, it means to make a totally maybe unplanned error, a mistake that we, well, mistakes generally are unplanned, of course, but a mistake that was due to complete absent-mindedness or maybe something we didn't prepare enough for, right? Uh, we just weren't quite ready for this to happen and we failed, so we could say we dropped the ball. Now, this could be that you forgot something that was very important and uh, maybe that's as simple as not setting your alarm at the right time and then not showing up to something that you were supposed to be at, then you would say, when you're apologizing, I dropped the ball. So you might say something like this. I'm so sorry I wasn't there at 8 o'clock like I said I would be. I totally dropped the ball. And then if you want to make an excuse, you could say, I accidentally set my alarm to 7.30 p.m. instead of 7.30 a.m., Again, I'm really sorry I dropped the ball. I'm not telling you to make excuses. I'm just saying that might be the reason that you did this. You really dropped the ball. And, well, you didn't do enough to make sure that you got up on time. But we could say something m m more professionally, like the customer service department really dropped the ball by ignoring one of their most loyal customers for almost a week. 
maybe they have a bunch of issues they're dealing with and they get a request from a very loyal customer, the customer service department, they don't realize that this is someone they should really be prioritizing. Their loyalty is very important. They have them in a queue and they're just dealing with them one by one and then this customer gets upset and leaves. Okay, well maybe that's a big deal and they dropped the ball, okay? So that's generally how we use drop the ball. Now we have one which is very similar and that one is to blow it. Now this one might be unique in a couple of senses. Number one, generally for drop the ball, it's not something that's happening right now. So in other words, we would usually say, don't drop the ball, or I hope you don't drop the ball, or oh, you dropped the ball, or sorry, I dropped the ball, right? But, but we wouldn't say you are dropping the ball, probably. It's not usually used in this ongoing sense, right? But if someone says, you're kind of blowing it here, then, well, that's a natural way to use it. So this one can be used to talk about an ongoing blunder or mistake, right? If I wasn't able to explain this very well, someone might whisper in my ear, Kathy might come over and say, hey, you're really blowing it with this explanation, maybe try again, or you must not have prepared for this one, right? You are blowing it. I'm really blowing it here. So this might be when you're speaking in front of others. This might be when you're doing something live and it's not going very well, you're kind of blowing it. And there, you probably wouldn't say you are dropping the ball, right? So uh, the past tense of this would be B-L-E-W and then I-N-G would be if it's an ongoing thing. I was so close to acing the presentation, but I blew it at the last minute. I blew it at the last minute. Now, if you say this to criticize someone, it's pretty blunt. It, it's a pretty harsh thing to say. So you would say it when you want to be brutally honest with someone. Listen, your presentation was good until the last 30 seconds and then you really blew it. That means you made a big mistake, some blunder, something happened. And in that way, it's very similar in meaning to uh, to drop the ball, except I think it's more immediate. It's more in the moment. It's more about the situation that you're in. Could you say, I, I'm sorry, I blew it. I didn't get up on time because I accidentally set my alarm to 7.30 p.m. instead of a.m.? Yeah, I think you could say that too. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, it's a little bit more in the moment, okay? Overall, same meaning. I had the chance to, let's say someone likes somebody, ask her out on a date, but I blew it because I got nervous. Okay, so there you blew your chance, someone might say. You blew your chance to ask him or her out. If you like someone, you want to ask them out. So to blow your chance is a way to use this that drop the ball really can't be used in. We can't really use drop the ball this way. You drop the ball your chance? I mean, eh, not so much, right? But if you blew your chance, it means here is an opportunity coming up. You're moving toward the opportunity and then you don't capitalize on that opportunity. And so it doesn't go according to what you wanted or according to plan. And now you may not have that chance anymore in the future, so you blew it. You often hear people say, I blew my one chance to have maybe a good relationship because, and then say what you did that caused that relationship to fail. You had a good one going and then you blew it because of a bad habit, because of how you're emotionally unavailable or something like that. Uh, you blew it. So it can be this ongoing thing as well. 
um, this one thing is the issue, but it's something maybe you did over a period of time. So it can be used in a lot of different ways. And it is, I think, very, very flexible, okay? Next, screw up. Screw up. Now, again, we have a very similar meaning with screw up. The next one we're going to talk about, I think, is quite different. But this one, while it is the same, has some nuance to it. I'll give you an example first. I would have got an A on the exam if I hadn't screwed up on the last question. Now, could you say drop the ball on the last question? I think so. Could you say if you hadn't blown it on the last question? I think so. But this one specifically is about a mistake a mistake that just happens at that time. Often when we use you blew it, right, or you dropped the ball, this is about a larger situation that we're in, whereas screwing up is this one individual thing that happens. There's one question and you missed it, right? Again, you can use the others this way, but this one tends to focus on that one instant, not this ongoing thing like blow, you're blowing it. We probably wouldn't say you're screwing up, you're screwing up. Usually not. You screwed up right there in that one instant, that one moment, you screwed up. You made a mistake right there at that time at a critical moment, right? Sorry, everyone. I really screwed up dinner. I forgot to set a timer. Some person really has a problem with time setting alarms, right? I forgot to set a timer on the roast. Now it's a charred black, charred a burned disaster, right? We have to go out to a restaurant now. You were cooking dinner, and then at the critical moment when you were supposed to take it out of the oven, you didn't. It stayed in for an hour too long because you were on the phone, and now it's ruined, and now you can't eat it because it's burned. So you have to go out to eat at a restaurant, right? You screwed up. But the interesting thing here is that we can say you screwed what up? And this is a great way to use screw up. So I screwed my knee up. Now we wouldn't say I blew my knee up. We wouldn't say I dropped my knee up, drop the ball on my knee up or anything like that. I don't know what that means. I screwed something up is a really useful and unique way to use screw up because you can talk about what it is, right? So I was, uh, I was running on some hills and I accidentally stepped on something the wrong way and I screwed my knee up. So I injured myself, right? So you really screwed up on something or you really screwed that up. So we often insert here the thing in the middle. I screwed, I screwed this thing, put it here, up. I screwed that live stream up. Ugh, I feel bad about that, right? Now you could add it after. You could say I really screwed up on that live stream or in that live stream, that would be okay to say. But the useful structural thing here is that we can put stuff in the middle between screwed and up, which I think is pretty interesting. So all of these, again, very similar. Drop the ball, to blow it, right? To screw up. But each has this little nuance that we can use them, we can use them sort of in slightly different ways. Now, you've probably heard someone being a uh, screw up, and that's okay too. Except if it's that, we would say probably F instead of screw there, right? I really effed up instead of screwed up, okay? So that's common. Basically used in the same way as, basically used in the same way as screw. Okay, moving on. We have two more to cover here. Two 
shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, now this one's probably pretty obvious in meaning, right? All you have to do is imagine you taking a gun and shooting yourself in the foot. So it's a particular type of mistake where it's what we could call an unforced mistake. In other words, no one is causing you to do it. It's not anyone else's fault. You are damaging something that you were trying to do because of you. It's your fault, no one else's, right? And it could be an instant thing, right? But probably not, at least not used that often. You wouldn't usually say that you shot yourself in the foot by missing the last question on the exam. There, you would probably just say, I screwed up the last question, a mistake that happened in that moment, a specific thing. To shoot yourself in the foot more broadly is usually to do something, maybe out of stupidity, maybe out of ignorance, maybe out of bad planning, to do something which then hurts something that you're trying to accomplish. So you're trying to build a relationship with someone or a friendship with someone, and then you do something that completely eliminates the possibility of you being friends with them. I really shot myself in the foot there, right? Or you're working on a deal, a business deal, and you accidentally share some information you're not supposed to share, and they find out about that, and then they don't trust you anymore, and so they call it off. Okay, well, again, you shot yourself in the foot because you did something that has caused you to now basically fail at whatever you were trying to do. You're not able to do what you wanted to do now, right? And so it's usually this part of this bigger process. It's not just this in the moment thing like screw up, right? It's part of a larger group of things that you're trying to do or a larger goal. So I was trying to impress my boss with my ideas, but I ended up shooting myself in the foot by proposing something that had already been shot down the week before. I didn't read the meeting notes for the meeting that happened last week, which I was supposed to do, and someone proposed this idea that they thought was genius, and then my boss said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No. <laughs> and then the next week, I said, hey, I've got a great idea, and I say the same thing. So I'm trying to impress my boss, but now I look like an idiot for two reasons. Number one, because I've suggested something that my boss thinks is dumb. And number two, because I didn't review last week's meeting notes like I was supposed to. And if I had done that, I would have known not to say this thing. So I've really shot myself in the foot, right? They sort of shot themselves in the foot when they decided to set bonus targets that didn't actually incentivize better quality work. So a company maybe sets goals, they incentivize people with bonuses to make them work harder or do more or whatever. But then they, the company shot themselves in the foot because they're actually not incentivizing higher quality work. Maybe they're just incentivizing getting more stuff done, right? If the bonuses you did a hundred things, wow, but quality is not important, then they're not incentivizing quality, they're incentivizing quantity. So they shot themselves in the foot by making a bad bonus policy, okay? Pretty simple, I think, right? Now let's look at our last one here. Moving right along, the last one is Miss the boat. Now, to miss the boat is usually related to opportunities. This is usually where timing is critical. And you can kind of picture it, right? If there's a boat that goes by 
have you ever seen those videos where there's a a ferry or something and then it's continually going by these docks and each dock has a mailbox on it and there's a usually a teenager whose job it is to jump off the boat with the mail, put the mail in the mailbox, and then run back and jump on the boat before it goes by, right? I don't know if you've seen those videos. I don't know why they're doing that, but I've seen it. Well, if they weren't able to jump back on the boat, then they missed the boat, right? And we say this when we talk about getting on usually public transportation. Ah, damn, I missed my train. I missed it, right? Ah, I missed the boat. It already left. It's gone now. So now you have to wait for the next one. So we can imagine what that would be in terms of mistakes. That would be when you should have taken advantage of something at a critical time and you did not. Or you're supposed to do this now. You didn't do it. Or you should have done it last week. You didn't do it last week. And because of that, now you've missed a major opportunity. So let's say most people missed the boat on crypto. There were some people who invested very early on in crypto and they made tons of money. But what happened was it went up very quickly. And that's when most people started investing in crypto. Oh, look at this crypto thing. So then people were investing their money, but it was it had already plateaued and then it crashed. So most people missed the boat on crypto. Often we add on there when we talk about the topic, okay? I was about to send my resume. Then I saw that they had already hired someone for the position. So I missed the boat. I missed the boat means I missed that opportunity, right? I, I'm not going to get this job because the position has already been filled. I missed the boat. Very simple, okay? So we have talked about a few hopefully useful and interesting idioms for mistakes. We talked about miss the boat. We talked about shoot yourself in the foot. We talked about drop the ball. We talked about screw up. Oops, I'm missing a C there. Honestly, fuck up there as well. And that's probably more common, right? We talked about, oops, what was the other one? <laughs> right, the last one, to blow it. And how each of these has a similar meaning broadly, but how there are nuances for all of them. What I recommend you do now is do a bit of a deep dive. Find more examples if you want to use ChatGPT, if you want to use the free dictionary, whatever. Find more examples and then try to make your own examples because only by making your own examples can you really make them stick. If you have any questions, let me know, okay? Share your examples with me. I would love to take a look. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button or follow and subscribe. And also, get a free course. That is a short course, but I think a useful one about mastering natural English conversations. That is also in the links in the description. In Morocco, we say miss the train. It sounds like it's the same, right? Sound like it sounds like it's basically the same, uh, the same expression, right? Why, why is this here? Go away. Go away. Missed the boat on correctly using the erase tool. Uh oh, now everyone knows I use Photoshop. Oh no. 
Thank you, Rada. I appreciate that. Is foul up used in in U.S. English? Mm. Foul up, I would say, is in my uh, not particularly common. I would say to foul something up or to bungle it. I know them, but I don't hear them very often, right? No, I think foul up feels more, to me, it feels more British English, honestly. It's just my, it's just my initial sense of it, right? Foul, you fouled it up. Ooh, yes. So, yeah. so it feels British when I say it. Yeah, British. I'm going to go with British English. That's what I'm going to go with. I'm excited to share the next topic because we're going to be talking about uh, commas, which is great, which I love. I mean, I don't love commas. But I think eh, it's going to be interesting. We'll see. Comma placement makes a big difference, right? Comma placement is huge. Okay, let's see if I missed any questions. I've, I've seen um, people in the chat. Hello, Yalel. Yeah. Leil, Yalel, mm. hello, welcome. Amar, hello. In Australia, they say stuff up. In the UK, they say bottle it. Okay, interesting. Jules, hello and welcome. Herman, in my country, we say miss the train. Okay, very good. Sounds the same. Rada Reda, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Fiasco is also a mistake. So fiasco is more like a disaster. A disaster. A terrible, terrible disaster is usually a fiasco. It's not a little thing. We probably wouldn't say, you know, missing that exam, that last exam question was a fiasco. But Enron was a fiasco. <laughs> you know, a large company failing due to... Uh, Actually, I don't know that much about what happened at Enron. <laughs> I know that there was a lot. Okay. AJ says, I got an idea because of you. I'm going to start a channel. Provide a platform to help people who are looking to improve their English for jobs. Okay. Yeah, great. Focus on, on specifically job interview English. I The only reason I don't do a channel that's specific to something like job interviews, although I, I have an entire course about job interview English, the only reason is that it's boring for me. I, I don't like to focus on one thing. I know that's often better for people to have a focus on one thing, right? But I simply feel bored to do the same thing all the time. And that's, that's about it. So yes, if you go to my website, I have a full course about job interview English. You can also find it on Udemy. It's a, I think it's a seven hour course and it focuses on basically everything, everything you need to handle the job interview process and also covers resumes and things like that. Hey, pal. How's it going? Thank you very much. It's going very well, pal. Thank you, Nihat. We have a terrible, terrible disaster here right now. Uh, Amar, are you in Turkey? If so, yes, that is horrible. Um, I know, I know, especially in Turkey, they're going through a, well, it's a horrible uh, earthquake recovery process. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable devastation okay shall we get to the shall we get to the commas I think we could do that All right, so let's get into our comma business. If I may, in the UK, says Vitali, you set your alarm for a certain time. I heard you say, <clears throat> set your alarm to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you could use either one, four or two. In that case, I think both would be okay. I might say, I might set my alarm to 
or set my alarm for 7.30. Uh, two or four, I would use both there. Four is also, also very common. Okay, comma time. It's comma time. Mar says, yep, I'm in Turkey. The situation is dire in Turkey and Syria. Yeah, so I've heard. I'm, uh, it's horrible. Uh, <clears throat> and I hope the disaster relief goes well. I know that, I believe that there are people still being um, discovered who have been trapped in buildings and things like that. Oof, it's awful. Awful. I wouldn't use the word fiasco for Turkey. That fiasco is so more like situational stuff. That would be just a disaster. It's a disaster. Natural disaster. And then we talk about that in the wake of a disaster, what people do, the efforts to um, help survivors and find missing people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit about the Oxford comma too. <clears throat> um, hold on, let me just do one thing very quickly. <clears throat> We often don't think about commas. Punctuation, does it really matter? Yes, it matters a lot, actually. Punctuation is important for a number of reasons. Number one, if you don't use correct punctuation, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And people may not take you seriously if you don't use correct punctuation. Because you know what? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. But things like commas can also make a difference, a huge difference when it comes to meaning, right? The placement of a comma, the placement of a hyphen, it can totally change the meaning of a sentence or two sentences. And we're going to look at some examples of some misunderstandings that could be caused by placement of or lack of a placement of commas okay and some of these we'll see might be uh, somewhat entertaining right but they highlight the importance of understanding how commas work so let's just hop right over and look at we're going to be looking at four specific examples okay we're here on the blackboard and the first one, I want you to just think about when you read it, okay? I'll read it, but I want you to think about what is this saying. She gets a lot of joy from eating her friends and family. So what is this? Well, what it's saying is that she is a cannibal, right? She eats, who, but who does she eat? She's selective. She doesn't eat everyone. No. She, she eats her friends and family. So this is horrifying, right? It's horrible. So if someone forgot to insert commas, they've now written a sentence about this horrible, horrible person. But if we simply add three commas to this, boom, everything is different. She gets a lot of joy, a lot of joy from eating. Her friends and family. Suddenly, the meaning has changed. Now what we're saying is that there are three things that give her joy. Eating, her friends, and, and probably there, her family. Now, for the sake of this example, I wrote it like this. I think generally, this might be written as she gets a lot of joy from eating delicious meals, 
spending time with her friends, right, and maybe something something with her family. We would probably make it a little longer, but I think it does highlight the importance of comma placement. Now, we will get into the placement of this comma in particular in a moment. I just want to mention quickly that this one is called the Oxford, the Oxford comma. Now the Oxford comma is used often, but sometimes not. A lot of people would say the Oxford comma is not necessary. A lot of people would say that it is necessary. This is this comma that goes if you make a list of three things, one, two, three, it goes right before the and, right before the last thing. And we'll look at an example of how that could possibly mess up the meaning of a sentence. But first, why don't we look at another example, okay? What does it mean if I say, stop asking everyone? What are you saying if you say, stop asking everyone? Well, basically what you're saying there is, there's a question, let's say, and whoever you meet, you ask. Let's just say the question is, how old are you? You meet someone and you say, how old are you? You meet a young lady and you say, how old are you? You meet a child, you say, how old are you? You meet an old, older person, an elderly person, you say, how old are you? And I'm starting to see that this is not a good question for you to ask, you know, stop asking everyone this question. If you're going to continue, stop asking everyone this question. I think it's causing awkwardness. It's very cringy to see. I don't like it. But one comma changes everything. Stop asking everyone. So when I do this one, putting the comma in front of everyone, now I'm addressing everyone. So what this means is that everyone was asking me something and I'm telling now everyone, a group of people, 10 people, 20 people, five people, two people, eh, maybe not two people, three people or more. I'm saying, I don't like you all asking me this question, please stop. So we use this structure with the comma after the instruction and before whoever it is addressed to, right, to basically separate out the instruction and the one or ones receiving the instruction, right? Stop talking, Greg. So there are three people here. Sam, Greg, Ricardo, three. And Ricardo is talking, and Sam is talking, and Greg is talking. I just want Greg to stop talking. Stop talking, Greg. Okay, you two, you're fine, but Greg, you stop, right? Okay, so I'm addressing Greg. I'm addressing everyone. Whereas, stop asking everyone, more generally, <laughs> means you have been asking every person that you meet, and I don't think that that's the right thing for you to do. Okay, now let's, let's keep going here. This is, I think, important stuff, but once you see it, it's kind of easy, right? Once you see it, you kind of know how it works. I sent Christmas cards to the murderers, my best friend and Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, the director of uh, Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. Okay. So here it's similar to what I just said, right? In, in, in a sense that the comma is telling me the direction or what the first thing is about. If I read this one like this, I sent Christmas cards to the murderers, my best friend and Peter Jackson. That means I sent Christmas cards to, to some murderers, right? And these are the names of the murderers. Well, one of them is my best friend. I could say my friend's name here. And the other one is Peter Jackson. So what I'm saying is that Peter Jackson and my best friend are murderers, right? And I could then in this case completely cross this out and say that this is an explanation of this, just to say who the murderers are. It's a detail. All it is is a detail, right? So, and this is really, really common, right? Uh, I gave a 
car to my best friends, comma, Tim and Lisa. Then Tim and Lisa are my best friends. I'm naming them, but if I remove Tim and Lisa, then the sentence is, I gave a car each to my best friends. And maybe I don't want to name them, right? Okay, so remove that. And now you just know that they're murderers, but you don't know who I'm talking about. But this is probably not what I want to say, right? What I want to say is, and it's a weird sentence, I know, but just for example, because I want to clarify what a comma can do. Basically, what I want to say is that there are three groups that I gave Christmas cards to. Number one, the murderers. <laughs> so maybe in a uh, earlier on in the conversation, we talked about a group of murderers. And I'm, I'm trying, maybe I'm trying to help them with their lives, stop murdering, right? So I'm trying to help them. So I feel like I want to send them Christmas cards from my heart, you know. And so I say I sent Christmas cards to the murderers, the ones I'm trying to help, and my best friend and Peter Jackson. So there, what I should do is have this Oxford comma. This is the value of the Oxford comma because it can, as you can see here, lead to possible misunderstandings. Now, if I have the comma here and here, it's telling you, oh, okay, so my friend and Peter Jackson, they're not murderers. They're just other people that I send Christmas cards to. Uh, so now I know I'm sending Christmas cards to number one, murderers, number two, my best friend, and number three, Peter Jackson right? It's not that Peter Jackson and my best friend are murderers. So this would be an argument for why you should use the Oxford comma to avoid possible misunderstandings there. Because you have the situation where these are seen possibly as an explanation or further detail of this thing, and it's not read as a list which leads to the misunderstanding. I personally feel that not using the Oxford comma is still okay because this kind of situation is very rare. Although, for example, Grammarly always recommends using the Oxford comma. So I think things are generally shifting in the direction of that. I used to be against the Oxford comma. I think now generally I am I'm in favor of the Oxford comma. I think I like the Oxford comma now. I've I've really I've changed my I've changed my tune when it comes to the Oxford comma. Okay. Now our last one. I invited my parents, John and Jane, for dinner. This is a similar issue, right? It's it's similar in a way. Let's talk about it. What is this saying as is? I invited my parents, John and Jane, for dinner. Well, it means my parents' names are John and Jane. Now, that's kind of weird because why would I name my parents? But okay, this is what this sentence is kind of saying, right? Who are your parents? So here we're, we're having, the, the, again, the detail of this. It's like the previous example. The thing that we could remove, it's a parenthetical. We can call it a parenthetical. If we get rid of John and Jane, then the sentence goes, I invited my parents for dinner, and that sentence can stand by itself, right? Okay, if that's what you're trying to say, then this is correct. It is absolutely right if you want to name your parents or name the murderers that you're sending Christmas cards to, right? But if that's not what you mean, then we have a communication issue, a misunderstanding caused by this, and all we have to do is add a comma right there, and now the meaning is, I invited my parents, John and Jane, for dinner. So there are three people who, or sorry, four people who I invited to dinner. My parents, that's two, and John, who you know, and Jane, who you know, and then I invited them to do what? To have dinner for dinner. Okay, so pretty clear. So it depends on what you want to say there, right? When it comes to commas, it's very important to know the placement. We talked about that, stop asking everyone. That is a common issue with commas that can cause misunderstandings. Do you want to say stop asking everyone or stop asking everyone, right, with the Oxford comma? 
maybe it's best to just use it to avoid possibly any misunderstandings like this because sometimes you might want to make a structure like this where you have this parenthetical that's giving you details which could be removed about these people or this person or the murderers, right? And in the case of the first example that we talked about, right? Sometimes if you don't use any commas, it can lead to some pretty horrifying results, right? as we saw in the first example. So at least we know that we do need to use commas. We have to know when to do it. It's very, very important. Hopefully this gives you a starting point to start at least thinking about this and paying attention to comma usage in sentences. If you have any questions about this or other examples that you'd like me to talk about, pop those in the comments if you haven't already done so. I would appreciate if you could hit the like button and subscribe or follow and also check out my free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the description. All right, all righty, okay. Any questions? Mr. Luck, long time no see. Thank you very much. Uh, Kadiri, that's Luke, by the way, L-U-K-E. Oxford comma is what it is called. Arthur says, I love soliloquies. They're the stuff of dreams and drama, the poetry of the spoken word, the rhythm and rhyme of the soul. Yes, I love soliloquies. They're like a symphony for the ears and the heart. Well, that's quite a comment. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Arthur. I appreciate that. All right. So if there are any questions, I think we could uh, we could talk about that. And otherwise, let's see. I did want to share a couple other things and take a look at the English Learning Reddit. That's something I wanted to do. We're not going to do an article or video where we learn words today. I just wanted to skip it. I don't know. I don't want to do it. I just don't want to. Let's hop over to... Let's hop over to... Reddit English Learning. And see if we can find anything interesting. What do you call this? A picture? I would call this a gazebo. A gazebo is this. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a gazebo. Let's see what people say in the comments. Oops. Like that. Do people say gazebo? That's a gazebo. Oh, thank you. Yes, a gazebo, gazebo, gazebo. Gazebo, gazebo, gazebo. Okay, Reddit English learning is fun to just scroll through. This word sounds cool and it doesn't even sound awkward, at least to me, but I was shocked no one used this word, wherefore. That's because wherefore is a antiquated word. It's not really used anymore. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And you can see the usage from the 1800s down to the present day. And it looks like there's a little, a little dip there. That's interesting. I, you know, I wouldn't expect that. Definitely not common anymore. What does suit in this line mean? Can somebody please explain this sentence? How well I remember the aged poet Sophocles when in answer to the question, how does love suit with age, Sophocles? So I think that suit is like that suits you, that fits you well, that uh, is a good fit for you, right? If you put on a pair of sunglasses at this at the glasses store, and the and the seller says, "Oh, I think it suits you well." Um, it's not that you're buying a suit; it's that it fits you. It matches your style. It matches the shape of your face, right? How does love suit with age? I think they're using it in the same way, without more context. I think that's what it is. From the White House on down, police dogs were portrayed as crime fighters and riot controllers. 
So White House on down, what does on down mean here? It means down the hierarchy or the rank. White House, uh, Office of the Press, Secretary of whatever, uh, Bureau of the blah, 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 uh, um, District blah, 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 uh, all of the levels down. So it's starting at the top and saying this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. On down is a somewhat casual way to refer to the levels of a hierarchy. How do you call these in English? Um, when you're showering, I would call them a wash cloth. So it looks like a knitted uh, cloth. And if it's for a shower, then that's something you would use to scrub yourself in the shower. If it's that hard abrasive material, I think that's called a loofah. Um, but if it's just a cloth and it's not meant to get rid of dead skin cells, a loofah is for the dead skin, right? But this should be just a washcloth, I believe. Yes, washcloth. I see that one there, washcloth. I only need two to confirm my, uh, what I think. That, that's three. That's enough. You only need three. Right. Uh, Pronouncing the continuous form of verbs ending with the K. What is the meaning of uh, paraphernalia? Uh, did you did that person enter my room and steal or stole? Mmm, this is a good one. I have a question about the use of steal in this sentence. I know you have did. The verb is in the present form, so is it did they steal? Because in this case, steal is separated by the and, and the second did is omitted, I think, so I don't know if I should be still a present tense or past one. So, did that person enter my room and stole my dress? Okay. Did that person enter my room and steal my dress? Because did is the, is the past tense, right? Did that person enter? Did they enter? Because did is in the past, we don't need enter to be in the past because did is taking the past form, right? You don't need to do double to have the past form. But it's the same for stole because enter and enter and steal are both connected to the to the did, right? Uh, so in this case, we don't need to change either of them to the past. Now. If we don't have did there and we make a statement, then we would put both of them in the past. We would say uh, that would be she or he went or entered. I guess we should say entered. He or she entered my room and stole my dress. We wouldn't say entered my room and steal my dress because there, both actions, they're not connected to anything like do or did as a question, right? The auxiliary verb did takes the sort of past form that we need and then we can keep the rest in the simple present tense. But in the case of stating what happened, two actions that happened in the past, stating them in a regular sentence, then we would use stole and entered in the past tense as a statement, if that makes sense. Ah, oh, some interesting questions in good old, good old Reddit English learning. Call of Duty Wiki. Da, 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 da. I might. Oh, you guys did the freshman year. Her parents were so pleased. Huh? Can native speakers usually distinguish a D sound from a soft TH sound? This person is clearly a, a non-native speaker. I don't know where she's from, but I noticed that sometimes she does pronounce the, this, that, but sometimes dis, dat, dis, etc. Et so, duh, dis, that. Am I wrong? Um, you know, sometimes people do say if they're in a rush or they just don't can't be bothered, they say, uh, dis, but uh, that doesn't mean that I would want to teach people how to use or teach people to use th like that. And the reason is the following. I am not in the business of teaching native English speakers 
how to speak because native English speakers grew up in the language. They speak how they speak. And if you're a native speaker in any language, you can be a better, become a better communicator. You can learn how to be more articulate, right? But you probably know everything you need to know about how to say things. If, if you want to say it, the or duh, do whatever you want, right? So what I'm here to do is, is teach people who simply don't know the right way how to do it if they want to, right? Teach people whose goal is fluency to become better communicators and know the correct pronunciation. So I'm not watching that video, but I'm assuming that person would say, oh yeah, I, I just say that because that's how I say it. I mean, I don't know. But when I teach English, I teach the as the pronunciation simply because that is the way that most people say it and that has become what we can call correct pronunciation. And so it's best to at least learn that first and then once you've achieved a level of fluency, decide whatever you want to do. Uh, like Picasso says, you have to learn the rules or master the rules so that you can then break them like an artist. In other words, until you get to a certain level, you shouldn't be not doing things correctly. You should strive to learn the right way, the quote unquote right, right way to do it and then make decisions about what you will or will not do once you know everything, right? Generally, that's how I see it. Did that person enter my room and stole my dress? Did someone unlawfully enter my chamber and purloin my attire? I, I get a feeling that Arthur likes formal sort of uh, formal language, which is cool, Arthur. I respect that. I'm not a big, huge fan myself, to be honest with you, but I respect that you do. That's great. All right. Okay. Mr. Yam, hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Good to see you. Good to have you. I think we're going to call it a day, folks, friends, neighbors, citizens. Thank you all so much for joining. It's been great to have you. I appreciate you being here. Those listening, watching later, thank you so much for listening and or watching. If you want to join live, we do these every Friday, sometimes Q&As, sometimes not, usually not, but we also have you know, some Q&A. Uh, and so feel free to join on either Facebook or YouTube. If you want to listen to these, you can do that in the links in the description. If you're not doing that already, that's the podcast version. You can also check that out, by the way, on my website. If you like, also links in the description. The Discord, which you can join for free, also in the links in the description, as well as uh, other stuff like my courses. You can get a discount on that or check them out on Udemy. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to get a free course, Natural English Conversations, also in the links in the description. Should be the first one that you see. Thank you all so much for joining. Vitali, Arthur, Mr. Yam, Reda, good to have you all here. Look forward to seeing you next week. I hope you can join. Have your questions ready to go. And I hope you all have a fantastic and magical weekend. Bye-bye.